Good day ladies and gentlemen, or shall I call you Ye Planeteers? My name is Alex Lenferner, and today I have the privilege of giving you a talk entitled Climate Change, Science and Society. This talk is part of the Applied Center for Climate and Earth System Sciences Habitable Planet Workshop, and is one of the core lectures. To quickly introduce myself, I am a PhD student at the University of Washington in Seattle, where I specialize in studying the ethics of climate change in the philosophy department. So the aim of the talk that I'm going to give you today is to look at the science of climate change, both the findings thereof and how it's produced, in order to try to unpack some of the implications that um, this has for us as a global human society. Right. One of the things that I'll hope you'll notice throughout this lecture is that, apart from this particular slide, I won't be putting in any pictures of polar bears. And the reason for this is not because I believe that the impacts of climate change on polar bears is unimportant, but rather it is to correct a distortion that's been put forward by the environmental movement. Because the environmental movement, by focusing on polar bears, the Arctic region, creatures and ecosystems beyond everyday human concerns, has sort of diminished the human aspects of the climate change crisis. Because climate change is indeed a deeply human crisis, not only because we are now the predominant cause of the change in climate, but also because the effects on climate change will be felt profoundly across human society. And this is an aspect that I hope to really bring to the fore in this lecture. And that is, of course, not to say that the impacts on other creatures and other environments are unimportant, for indeed, climate change, under some of the worst-case predictions, can cause a, from a third to two-thirds of species loss across the planet, which is devastating. And so the impact of, on other species is an incredibly important consideration when dealing with climate change. However, throughout this lecture, I do want to focus more on the human aspects of climate change. So, when we begin to start telling the story of climate change, and for me, I like to begin by looking backwards. Backwards quite from the past. If we look at this graph here, we can go 60 million years before the present. What this graph tracks is the temperature change throughout that time. And one of the first things that I'll help you notice is that the temperature is constantly changing. Indeed, that may be one of the few constants in our climate. Temperature goes up and down and up and down and up and down, up and down and up and down and so on across 60 million years of time. So given that the climate has always changed, the question that we need to then ask ourselves is what is so significant about the climate changing now and why should we worry about it if we should at all? And in order to answer this question, we need to zoom in a bit closer to the present. Let us choose this particular area here where Homo sapiens, human beings, supposedly wise ape, appears on the planet. So about 400,000 years ago, Homo sapiens began to inhabit uh, the globe and began to spread across it. And what we'll notice is that during the time we've been on the planet, the climate has also changed considerably. However, as we move closer to the present, we notice this little band over here of somewhat constant temperatures. And that band goes about 10,000 years before the present. And what's really special is that during this relatively stable climate period here, where temperatures didn't move more than between a range of about one degree Celsius or so, during this 10,000 year period, we've seen an explosion of human progress. Right? So we've moved from being pretty much you know, cavemen to sort of hunter-gatherers. And then in this 10,000 years, we developed agriculture. We developed the Industrial Revolution. We really saw magnificent human progress, rising from being, you know, hunter gatherers just gathering food and hunting for a living to developing the incredibly advanced civilizations that we have nowadays. And so we were able to take advantage of this relatively stable climate in order to push forward all these various different um, forms of progress. Right? And so the importance of a stable climate for us has been significant. As a human, as human species, especially over the last 10,000 years. Another thing to notice in this graph is the relationship between this red line here and this blue line for temperature. The red line indicates carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, whereas the blue line again indicates temperature. 
One thing you'll notice is that the two flow together quite nicely. And this is because, as you'll hopefully know by now, greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide are regulators of the climate, such that all other things being equal, there is an increase in greenhouse gases, then there will be an increase in the temperature in our atmosphere and across the globe. Right. And so greenhouse gases play an important role as a temperature regulator in our climate. Right. And this graph shows this relationship to hold quite true, where temperature and greenhouse gases move together. Right. However, towards the end of this graph, you might notice a somewhat of an anomaly. Whereas over the last 450,000 years, carbon dioxide uh, levels haven't really reached over 300 parts per million. And parts per million is the measure that we use to see how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. Then, as we get close to the future, it moves way beyond this 300 parts per million. It just shoots up, so much so that it looks like there's an error in this graph. But this is no error at all, for indeed this rise in greenhouse gases is caused by us by Homo sapiens. So much so that we've moved from about 280 parts per million in 1880 to about 400 parts per million now. And this rise has occurred pretty much in the last 100 years or so. And by looking into the history of our climate through things like Antarctic ice core readings, we've been able to tell that the CO2 levels have risen 200 times faster in the past 50 years than any other time in the past 600, 650,000 years, which is an incredible rate of change. While these numbers might seem somewhat abstract, if we remember that the temperature and greenhouse gases are closely linked, where an increase in greenhouse gases causes an increase in temperature, we see that such a rapid change begins to cause for concern, because our ecosystems are adapted to deal with climate change because, as we saw earlier, the climate always changes. But they're used to eco they're used to the climate changing at a much slower rate than it currently is, and so by increasing greenhouse gases so much and so quickly, we are changing the climate at a speed that ecosystems are not used to adapting to. And neither is human society, which for the last 10,000 years has evolved in a very stable climate. And so we see that the rate of change of the climate is really one of the biggest things to worry about. So why is it? How are we changing the climate so quickly? How are we changing the greenhouse gas levels? And the single most uh, prevalent answer to that is energy and fossil fuels. Indeed, fossil fuel use accounts for close on 90% of human greenhouse gas emissions, with the remainder made up by cement production, land use change, food waste, and a range of other sources. And so, fossil fuels being such a predominant source, it is worth concentrating on them. Fossil fuels generally come in three major forms, that is coal, oil, and gas. And apart from often using fossil fuels in production processes such as oils and plastics, predominantly we use fossil fuels for the energy that they provide us with. Indeed, when we burn fossil fuels, it provides us with significant amounts of energy. For instance, one barrel of oil was equivalent to 23,200 man hours. And for those who have access to this sort of energy, it gives them a significant advantage. Indeed, this can be seen on a global scale. If we look to this graph here, on this axis, we see kilowatts per capita, which is a measure of energy per capita. And on this axis, we see GDP per capita, which is gross domestic product per capita, which is a measure of economic output per capita. And we see here that countries like the USA, Canada, Australia, France, and many of the um, supposed developed economies of our time have both a high energy usage relating to a high GDP uh, or high economic growth. And of course, this relationship is not perfect. For for instance, we see that Italy and South Africa, while both using similar amounts of energy, have very have a very different GDP per capita, which of course relates to the fact that not all economies are as efficient in how they turn energy into economic output. However, what this graph does illustrate is that there is a strong relationship between the amount of energy used and the growth of an economy. Indeed, because of the success of fossil fuels, oil and fossil fuels now pulse through the lives of most people on Earth. When we power our computers and lights, when we eat our meals, drive our, clothes, our cars, 
And even in the clothes we, are, we wear, we are often reliant on fossil fuels in some form or other, whether it's to transport the goods to us, whether it's in the production of them. Um, many steps along the way of the products we use, um, the things that we buy, have fossil fuels embedded in them. And be this is because animal and human power have, to a large extent, been replaced by fossil fuel fed machines. And of course, for those who have access to the energy that fossil fuels provide, this gives them a great advantage. Indeed, this may be said to be the defining aspect of our industrial era, but the byproduct of our industrial era's success has driven a significant increase in greenhouse gas emissions because as we burn fossil fuels, as they are hydrocarbon based fuels, they release greenhouse gases in the form of carbon dioxide and other emissions. So, how have global temperatures responded to the success of the Industrial Revolution and the byproduct of greenhouse gases? I now turn to a video um, from NASA in order to illustrate this. And what this video tracks is the surface temperature changing since the Industrial Revolution in about 1880. As we see, blue is the colder and red is warmer. And so it started off relatively blue and then it gets warmer and warmer. Of course, it is not a uniform change because of the dynamic nature of our atmosphere. But as we can see, the planet is warming up significantly since the Industrial Revolution in 1880. So it is now the planet is significantly warmer than before our industrial experiment. And of course, while the warming in itself might seem quite alarming, it is worth once again focusing on the rate of change. Indeed, Stanford scientists have found that the current pace of warming is happening 10 times faster than any time over the last 65 million years. And so, in the past 65 million years, although ecosystems have had to deal with change, it has been at least 10 times slower than what is occurring now. And so really we are just not equipped and neither are our ecosystems equipped for this sort of change. And so how is it that our globe has been responding? And I now turn to another video, this time from a, an environmental organization named 350.org to begin to explain some of the impacts that a changing climate is having on us. And so, as that video from 350.org shows, the effects of the changing climate are already upon us, and they're set to get worse as our climate warms. These effects include increased sea level rises, non-uniform changes in temperature across the globe, increased frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, such as floods, droughts and hurricanes, often contributing to increased water scarcity, especially regions such as Sub-Saharan Africa, 
where already we face water scarcity, and so this will just be intensified often by the effects of climate change. Other effects include the spreading of diseases um, through, for instance, insects being able to move into new changing climates, as well as many other deleterious effects on human health. Another effect of a warming climate is the driving of various different feedback loops, which in turn make climate change worse. For example, in the Arctic tundra, um, and the Arctic tundra is essentially just an area in the Arctic of pretty much frozen land. There is a vast store of methane gas under this frozen land. And as the tundra melts because the earth warms, then more and more of this methane gas, gas is being released into the atmosphere. And methane gas is a significantly powerful, potent uh, greenhouse gas. And so as the, as the earth warms and releases more of this methane gas, more climate change is occurring driven by this increased methane gas. And this is causing a positive feedback loop. And when we say positive, it doesn't mean it's a good thing. In fact, it's only positive because increasing this cycle of greenhouse gases and is a very negative thing. And each effect in itself might seem quite negative and perhaps quite worrying. But when we look at the cumulative effects, it paints an even more gruesome picture. Indeed, a report by the UN Development Program and the Human Progress Report holds that an additional 3 billion people might be pushed into poverty by 2050 but we do not confront our environmental crises like climate change. That's an additional 3 billion people being pushed into poverty. These are levels of poverty that we just haven't seen before. And so the cumulative impacts of a changing climate could be devastating across the globe if we do not deal with this problem. However, before going on to explore in more detail the uh, negative effects of climate change and how we might go about dealing with them, let us return quickly to the video by 350.org and an argument put forward in it. In the video by 350.org, it says that there is an increased number and intensity of extreme weather events that have been occurring. And while many have tried to refute this claim, reports put forward by the World Meteorological Organization, amongst a number of other organizations, suggest that this is very much a true claim. And indeed, as we progress and as the climate change conti climate continues to warm and change, we will see that this increase in both frequency and intensity of extreme weather events will continue and rise. The other claim that is often uh, debated is whether humans are causing the increase in intensity of extreme weather events. Um, and of course, extreme weather events have been around um, since before humans began to influence the climate um, and human civilization. Even before the Industrial Revolution was certainly no stranger to natural disasters. And so, of course, natural disasters have always, have always been around, so we're not the cause of all of them. However, a report put forward by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration just about a month ago showed that anthropogenic global warming has contributed to half the extreme events in the year 2012. And what it means by saying it contributed to these extreme events is that it increased the probability of them occurring and also of them being more intense. And so we see that this second premise in the argument is somewhat true. Humans are indeed contributing to both an increased probability and increased intensity of extreme weather events. The last premise, which often uh, is a very controversial, is that because this is occurring, we can blame damages from extreme weather events on the fossil fuel industry. And this is a tactic that 350.org as an organization has taken, is to blame a lot of this on the fossil fuel industry. And of course, the fossil fuel industry is a big culprit in it because they are the ones that extract the fossil fuels and often they are the ones that corrupt our politics and do not allow us to move away from fossil fuels and as providers of our energy sources. However, it is important to remember that when it comes to energy consumption and energy use, people across the globe are the ones who create a demand for energy usage. And so the, the blame cannot be heaped solely on the fossil fuel industry, even though they are indeed a prominent player when it comes to global warming. And so, the argument put forward by 350.org, while quite strong, is certainly in need of some qualification. What is not in need of qualification, however, is that global warming is occurring, that it is caused predominantly by human beings, and that it is bringing about devastating effects already. Furthermore, if we look to the future, if greenhouse gas emission levels continue as they are, 
then we are faced with a potentially very bleak future as the effects of climate change worsen. On that note, let us now turn to the future to see what some of the predictions around climate change might be. Before doing so, or in doing so, it is worth noting that the current uh, effects of climate change that we are feeling are not directly as a result of current greenhouse gas levels, but are rather related to uh, greenhouse gas levels from about 20 to 50 years ago. And that is because it takes a significant amount of time for the warming caused by greenhouse gases to actually play out in the atmosphere. And so there is this lag between when greenhouse gases are emitted and between when the warming occurs. Right. And this is because greenhouse gases have a significant life lifetime within our Earth's atmosphere and other biosystems or biosphere. Um, anyway, with that being said, what that means is that we already have a significant amount of warming locked into our Earth's climate from the pollution levels that are that will continue to warm the climate going forward. And so the question that we face now is how much more warming will we lock into our Earth's systems? Right? And in order to look to the future, I turn now to the work of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The IPCC, or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is the leading international body when it comes to the review of and assessment of climate science. And so the graphs that I'm about to show you come from the um, assessment reports that are released by the IPCC on a somewhat regular basis. And this comes from the latest one released just a few days ago. And so what this um, graph is trying to show is looking at the future uh, projected emissions of greenhouse gases. And this, of course, is based on various different projections of how economies across the globe might uh, might act um, with regards to reducing their greenhouse gas levels, increasing their economic output. And of course, it's not a perfect science, but these sorts of predictions are the, some of the best tools we have in order to see where we're going and how we might begin to change our um, actions um, in order to properly address the realities of climate change going forward. And so when we look closer at this graph, we see that there are various lines representing various different emissions scenarios or projections as to what we might do in the future. One important line here is this green one here. And what that green line represents is a goal that has been put forward by the United Nations. And the goal is to keep greenhouse gas emissions below 450 parts per million. Remember that we are already at 400 parts per million and rapidly rising. And we are getting rapidly close to that 450 parts per million goal. And the reason that goal was put in place was as a so-called safe limit that the world wants to keep global warming below. And what it would mean is that if we aimed at 450 parts per million, we would stand about a 50% chance of keeping warming below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Of course, we are currently at 0.8 degrees Celsius above uh, pre-industrial levels, and we're already feeling pretty negative impacts of climate change. And so if we get to 2 degrees, we will definitely feel a more and worse effect of climate change. And so the idea that this is a safe level is more of a political goal than the reality that this will be safe climate change. Uh, but it is certainly better than we are where we are currently headed, which is at about 4 degrees Celsius by the end of 2100. Right. And indeed, there are various different scenarios relating to various different concentration levels, some of which are worst case scenarios, others are, others are more optimistic. But as I said, it seems, um, according to the latest IPCC report, that at current levels of greenhouse gas emissions, we are headed to about a 4 degree rise from pre-industrial levels by 2100. And this would bring about some rather devastating uh, effects of climate change. Even more concerning is that if we allow emissions to continue along this pathway, uh, moving looking beyond 2100 because of the long lifespan of greenhouse gases and continued emissions going forward because of positive feedback loops and continued human emissions, we face the real possibility of by 2300 um, hitting something like 12 degrees Celsius uh, rise um, in temperature from pre-industrial levels. 
and in doing so leaving uh, behind a world for uh, future generations which would not be able to really support human civilization as we know it um, and has been described by people by, as such as David Roberts as simply hell on earth um, which while somewhat of an exaggeration is perhaps an appropriate description um, because it's as close as we can maybe get to hell on earth but on that rather bleak note, I'd like to end this the first half of this uh, this lecture. Um, when we return for the second half, we'll look at how we are responding to the climate crisis, whether we're responding adequately, how perhaps we can go about ramping up that response. Um, yeah, and uh, hopefully we'll leave on a more optimistic note at the end of the second lecture, um, plotting out the opportunities for us in dealing with climate change while not forgetting the very real crisis that we as human civilization are facing.